Hi, hello everyone. I'm not sure if you can hear me. So let's uh, test this first. Um, okay, can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Well, I'm glad that uh, you guys can hear me. So I'm going to start uh, sharing uh, my screen and go through my talk. Actually, I was a postdoc at MIT before I joined Meta. And um, so my background is in optics. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about, you know, the waveguide-based augmented reality displays, which is one of the technologies that, that has a lot of potential for, for augmented reality. Uh, so I'm going to share, start sharing my screen now. I'm going to give you an overview of waveguide-based uh, displays. And um, this is, I think, a nice kind of um, start for this uh, conference. Um, so um, we're going to go through some, of, some sort of a survey of different, uh, you know, they've got technologies. And um, uh, hopefully, I'll be able to talk about more details of you know, how to make these wave, wave guys and such. But let's see how far we can go. So last year in this talk, in this event, uh, John uh, presented some of the sketches I've done before, two years ago, on future of augmented reality and virtual reality when I was at MIT. So um, this sketches basically um, kind of shows where I see the, the hardware itself going from you know, where we were two years ago. And um, Obviously, we're going to, you know, smaller form factors, more sensors on the headset, you know, eye tracking, depth cameras, you know, uh, and, and later on, we would have, you know, more kind of um, input devices for these headsets. And hopefully then we will tap into, you know, brain waves to be able to facilitate or assist some of some of the control mechanisms in this. But interestingly, I, I predict that, you know, the cell phone won't go away, although a lot of people will predict that, you know, the cell phones and the monitors would, would go away completely. I, I don't think that that is going to be the case. Um, and so we, even, you know, 10 years from now, we're still going to have cell phones. But these cell phones are going to be much more uh, adapted to, to these headsets. So if you want to see more of these kind of um, futuristic visions that I have, you can go to imtspace.com, which is a website. Uh, I have, which I post a bunch of these things and interviews with, with you know, uh, different professors on, on different uh, uh, interesting technology topics. So I'm not going to repeat the last year presentation. This year, today, I'm, I'm going to mostly go through, through the waveguides and, and basically cover this, this uh, technology so you can get a more technical sense of uh, where things are and, and what are the problems and, and what are the, you know, basics of these, this technology. Okay, so... Every, every once in a while, I'm going to ask you a question. So can you hear me? Just tell me yes so I can make sure that this thing is not disconnected. Okay, great. So um, <clears throat> there are two major classes of, of optics that, that you know, brings the image to the eye for augmented reality displays. One is based on visors. That is, you have, you have a, you know, a, a you know, a sheet of glass that is curved that is bringing the image to your eye. And now this visor can be fed with many different uh, technologies, many different engines. So one is visors, the other one is waveguides. Now visors can be fed with different engines, such as displays, you know, uh, micro displays, LCOS, or they can be fed with projector. That is, that's the engine uh, that is generating the, the, the image. And waveguides, on the other hand, they, they come in different shapes and they use different te techniques to basically um, um, integrate all of that, that imaging relay kind of uh, functionality in a, in a slab of glass or a transparent material. So if you want to go over you know, different ways that waveguides output images, these are the kind of the four or five ways that they do it. So one is diffractive outcoupling, and I will explain what is the incoupling and outcoupling. So outcoupling means how they output the light into the eye, okay? So imagine you have a piece of glass, okay? You are putting the image into it, you're feeding the image into it from one side, and you're, you're getting the image being, being uh, you know, projected out from this, this piece of glass. So the outcoupling can be diffractive, can be holographic, can be polarized thin layer outcoupling, or it can be reflective outcoupling. And there's also two, uh, you know, two major categories that people also um, categorize these waveguides to, and these two categories are diffractive 
and geometrical. So these four can go on under those two categories as well. And then there's other advanced methods that, that, you know, that are still very, very researchy. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of the two major classes of, of um, relays, if you will. Um, okay, so I, I guess I'm having uh, some issues. There's, there's uh, multiple people coming to the room which I'm supposed to be talking. So let me, let me, um, let me, let me just move to a different, a different room. Meta's in the old GoPro offices, and that's an example where a company was doing well, but I think they mispositioned themselves, and so they were able to kind of make their headquarters available. So that's where he is in California. San Mateo, where Tom Brady grew up, not too far from this building. Um, and uh, Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry for that. Uh, <clears throat> Hopefully, people will leave me here. Um, OK, so, so here is a, the slide that shows kind of an overview of different, different products or different, at least, um, prototypes that has been out there. So you can look at the field of view. The field of view is basically the, the angular range that, that the, the augmented reality headset will cover. So this is very important because if you have larger field of view um, and larger binocular region, you basically get more sense of immersion. And of course, if you have light field, you would you know, have a better uh, accommodation with your eyes. So the, the white triangle, the white uh, rectangles show augmented reality headsets, and the black rectangles are for virtual reality headsets. And this is adapted from uh, Bernard Kress kind of slides, so basically updated from that. So you can see where is Meta 2. Uh, Meta 2 is kind of 85 degrees, it's relatively large, uh, but you know, Oculus. Uh, DK2 is, for example, uh, the development kit 2 is 150 degrees. And then there is a new startup that's called StarVR IMAX, as a pro associated with IMAX, that uh, claims that they can do 150 degree uh, field of view, which is very, very large. So this um, <clears throat> slide, if you can see it properly, um, shows, again, um, you know, the angular resolution versus field of view for different devices, okay? And it also shows the, 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 the human vision kind of limits. So the human vision kind of limit is, is 154 you know, degrees you know, field of view. And the angular, um, um, angular resolution is about 50 pixels per degree. So um, if you have basically something that is, that gives you that 50 pixels per degree and 154, um, you know, degree wide, then you're almost like indistingu in, indistinguishable from, from reality. So right now, um, um, you can see where we are with Meta 2, with, with, with uh, Oculus. So there's a trade-off, right? If you have increased field of view, you have, you know, a, a constant, let's say if you have a constant number of pixels, you would have to uh, divide that into the, that, that uh, angle, that, that field of view, which means you would have less pixel per degree, right? So your resolution kind of drops. And that's why you can see that for, for something like Google Glass, you have very high, you know, very high pixel density, but you have very small field of view. But for something like Meta, you have, you know, very large field of view, but you have very low pixel density. Similar thing with, with Oculus um, examples. Now, Star VR is, is, you know, working on bringing both, both of these things, like, you know, both larger field of view and higher pixel density, but it's a VR, it's not, it's not an AR. Um, so let's get some of, some of the, the assumptions here so that we can go through the waveguides in, in a better, uh, more uh, unified way. So one of the assumptions is that the augmented reality headset is, is trying to mimic the optical wavefront that is coming from the scene um, it, it, it's, it's just trying to synthesize, uh, like make some some wavefront that is exactly like a you know like a real world. So that's that's kind of the assumption that we are making. So we are not doing any retinal um, um, scanning here. That's that's actually the case for almost all of the all product that is out there right now. So um, if you look at this um, dashed kind of red line. And that is the, the exit pupil of, of, the, uh, uh, 
of the head mounted display. So can you see that, the red dashed lines? Hello? Is that, can you see the red dashed lines in this picture? Yes, we can. Okay, okay, great. So this shows the exit pupil, and it doesn't really matter, you know, how complex your optics is, if you have, you know, two visors, or you have, you know, a virtual reality headset, it's just going to be, um, um, it's just going to be, uh, you know, the, at the end, you have this exit pupil, and you want to make this wavefront. So you can see the bundles of light going at different angles um, into, into, into the eye. So if you look at um, <clears throat> this slide, now this slide shows some of the basic, you know, basic um, uh, parameters of a, of a uh, waveguide. So one of the basic parameters for most of the augmented reality displays is exit pupil. So you have, you know, this distance that on the glass, the light is coming out from, from this glass slab. Then you have eye relief. The eye relief is the distance from the surface of your eye to this glass slab. And then you have field of view, which we talked about, and eye box. Now, eye box is the region in space where your eye can, can see a focused image from this waveguide, okay? And these waveguides usually rely on some light being coupled into them. And, and uh, at some point, there is either a diffraction grating or some components in the glass or on the surface of the glass that would force the light to come out. Now, for the light to be able to go through this glass and bounce back and forth, it would have to be at a certain angle so it's kept in the glass until it hits that surface. And that's usually dictated by total internal reflection, uh, which is based on the Snell law in, in, in optics. It's a very, very simple law. Most people have heard about it in high school, and so I'm not going to go through it. Um, so here is a one kind of a basic idea. If you wanted to have a piece of glass that wanted to bring the image to your eye, uh, you could, you know, have a mirror with an angle, as you can see, and this mirror would, uh, would uh, basically, um, you know, direct a collimated image into the, the set of reflectors, and these reflectors, if they were curved, uh, they would be able to output the bundle of, you know, rays at different angles. And that's actually what Magic Leap is, is uh, you know, claiming. So it's very difficult to make this, this curved, you know, surfaces inside the glass or inside transparent materials. Um, they have to be very accurate. Uh, they have to have certain, you know, chromatic behavior. So um, that's kind of the challenge. But if you could do that, then you could, you know, really uh, easily, you know, bring the image, image um, to the eye. Now, there's another way to get around uh, manufacturing these kind of curved, sur curved surfaces inside the waveguide, and that is to have one curved surface at the start, can, can be a mirror outside the glass lab, but then you have flat kind of surfaces inside, inside the glass or inside the transparent slab. And that's easier to manufacture, but as you can see, because now the, the light is, has angle inside, it's kind of reflecting from the surface of, of the glass or, or the transparent material, uh, you will be limited by the angle that total, ref, uh, total internal reflection would be able to carry. It means that if you have too large angle and you want to have, you know, kind of light going at a very steep angle into your eye, you would have to have a larger kind of um, angle um, with regard to the surface, which means that your light would basically just go outside the slab in, immediately in the first reflection and it, it wouldn't make it to the exit pupil. So that's one of the major challenges in making these waveguides with larger field of views. Now, recently what, what Microsoft uh, uh, announced was um, two of the inventors there, they said, well, why, don't we have, why do we have to have light going from one side? We can have light going from two sides. So this way we can increase the field of view to double. And that's actually true. You can, you can do that. So you can increase the field of view by having light going from, from both sides. But there's still some challenges for implementing that either in the glass or having two engines from two sides. It's, it's not an easy, easy task. It's a, but it's an engineering task. It's not, it's not a fundamental problem. So how about the vertical field of view? In these images that I showed here, you can see kind of the horizontal field of view. That is how, how the eye sees different 
horizontal angles, but how about the vertical angles? Well, it's kind of the same for vertical angles. And, and um, you can see that uh, for, for vertical angles, you know, you can have the same kind of a curved curvature vertically to bring, bring the images to your eye. So it's really, it's not that different. It, you just have to think in 2D and you can have the vertical field of view as well. Another kind of basics that you have to know when you're talking about waveguides for augmented reality is, is uh, Bragg reflection and Bragg uh, uh, condition. So Bragg reflection means that if you have a periodic structure, this periodic structure can reflect the light in a weird angle, in a desired angle with a certain efficiency based on the wavelength and the periodicity of, of this structure. This periodicity is comparable to the wavelength of the light. So I'm not going to go through details of it, but what I'm going to go through is, you know, what are different waveguides that are out there right now? So the waveguide, one of the first waveguides that, that, that uh, was demonstrated was diffract, waveguide with diffractive outcoupling, which means that it had kind of certain small ridges on the surface of, of the piece of, you know, polymer substrate or glass that could diffract the light. If based on, you know, the Bragg ref reflection, it could diffract the light into a certain angle and output the image, right? Because once you input this, this light into the glass, the problem is how to get it out, right? So these micro ridges, this tiny etching on the, on the surface, they can help you to do that. So uh, Nokia first uh, did this, and then this was you know, uh, demonstrated in Wuzik's uh, kind of product, and then it was kind of acquired by Microsoft HoloLens. So right now, the Microsoft HoloLens uses diffractive waveguides. And, and the advantage of this is that you know, it's easy, relatively easy to, to manufacture, but the disadvantage is it provides small field of view, and the larger you want to go, because you're pushing on the efficiency of the, uh, the Bragg reflection, which is based on laws of physics, it, you would start to get more um, chromatic uh, problems. So for example, the green will reflect in, in a slightly different angle than red, than blue, and that's why your image will have some color non-uniformity. So that's some of the challenges for diffractive kind of waveguides. And also it's difficult to go to higher angles because you have to make these, these um, etchings into higher and higher kind of horizontal angle. And this, this would cause this kind of undercutting into the polymer or glass, which is very difficult to fabricate. So that's another challenge. So some of the companies like, like Digilens, they said, well, why, why do we have to etch the material? We're not going to etch the material. But we, we're going to use, you know, photopolymers, like the ones that are used in holograms for, for decades. And we're going to make this periodic structure by curing these photopolymers to change their refractive index periodically and, you know, make our, our diffractive outcoupling element. And they actually were very successful. So they, they you know, they, they, they were providing, you know, components for military based on this principle for, for some time. And, and uh, it was it was good for that application but again some of the problems here is that because you're still relying on Bragg reflection uh, you you have some color crosstalks which means that the periodicity for red should be slightly different for periodicity for blue and green and so and so on which means that you would have to have a sandwich of different photopolymer and polymer layers to be able to address each color correctly and when you start to go to different angles you again get color crosstalks so your field of view is uh, limited here, and also you know you have color non-uniformity. Um, let's get one thing straight. I think it's very important for for this conference because I've seen a lot of people in in the field they refer to you know 3D images like stero uh, stereoscopic images as as holograms, but that's actually not not true. Academically, you know a hologram is you know a, 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 it's like a photograph. It's like when you print something, when you, when you um, write into a medium like a photopolymer by interfering, you know, a certain light, uh, that's, that's where you, when you get a hologram. So a hologram, you can think of it as, as a photograph written by interference of light, okay? And when you shine it with a, with a monochromatic light or, or different types of light sources, usually coherent light source, you get a holo, you know, you get a hologram, like you, you, a holographic image. So... On the other hand, light field is, you know, what usually people refer as in industry refers as hologram. And light field is basically the, the, the light, uh, you know, vector 
as its whole entity. So it, it, it includes the, the 3D space and the, the two vertical and horizontal angle. That's why it's a, it's a five-dimensional vector field, and that's what a light field is. So if you're, if you're attending an augmented reality conference, you should, you should you know, get these words correct. And then the diffraction is usually the interference of a wave with itself with, because of the small perturbation uh, in the, in the, in the uh, space. So for example, if you have a tiny particle, that particle can diffract the light. Uh, let me go back to this. Okay. So, so these are three diff different kind of um, uh, terminologies that should be get right. Um, and um, if you're using interferometric uh, fringes, fringe pattern recorded into the photopolymer, then you're using, you know, photographic kind of uh, um, uh, waveguides, and it's intrinsically intrinsically limited in field of view. If you have small gratings patterns, then you're using diffractive method, and that's also limited. So here's some of the you know, parameters are diffraction optimization. I'm not going to go through them. But basically what people do is that they, they run top optimizations to get this periodicity of these uh, periodic structures right. And another way to, another set of waveguides are based on uh, polarized reflective outcoupling, which is, as I mentioned, they have some thin layers inside the glass. And these thin layers reflect the light uh, based on their polarization. And these, this method, luckily, provides larger field of view, and it has, you know, higher color accuracy, but it's slightly more difficult to manufacture. So that's one of the problems. The other problem is that each of these reflectors, they reflect the light just by a tiny bit. So your, your efficiency is very low in these kind of waveguides. One of such companies that makes these waveguides is Loomis. Okay. So... The final kind of set of waveguides is based on reflective outcoupling. So these, these reflectors are not polarized. And, and one such waveguide was used in uh, early Epson kind of, uh, uh, you know, prototypes or products. And then, um, so this one does not suffer from color non-uniformity because you have just, you know, certain reflectors. And, and it's compatible with using plastic to make this. It doesn't need glass because the previous one needed glass to make those thin layers. But the problem is very thick. So you have this giant slab of transparent material in front of your eye, which will most likely distort the world, world a little bit. Um, you know, a, another company that, that is using this is also OptiVent. So some of, some of the drawings that you saw was, was from an article by OptiVent that is using this kind of a glass of slab. Now, I don't know, maybe some, some, there's some, some people from, from uh, OptiVent in the audience. Some of the common technologies is to have an active material for that you know, piece of glass. Why should that piece of glass be just, just a passive piece of glass? It can be actually, uh, uh, for example, it, it can have some active material in it, such as liquid crystals or something like that. And that would help help uh, the, the accuracy of colors and such, it would basically give you more degrees of freedom to engineer. So this is one of the things that, for example, DigiLens is, is looking into right now. So uh, as a final kind of recap, this success of smart glasses in consumer electronics is, is really comes down to the form factor and that begins and ends with near eye optics. This is a sentence from Christopher Garrison, which might be in the audience. Uh, um, which writes a, a, writes a lot about augmented reality headset, and I agree with him uh, because you know if, if you have something that is extremely bulky, even if the image quality is really good, you know you, you cannot just wear it for a long time. So that's um, kind of um, my talk. If if I have more time, I can keep going. <laughs>